me better. All right, that's. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna go there. I'm not gonna do that. Anyway, this is a little talk about that song, though. That song that. Uh, it's the song that goes like this. It goes. <laughs> Anyway, that's Lick It Up by Kiss, okay? Uh, we're here to talk about that today uh, because my good friend David Ivey got me thinking about that song. Uh, he's named David Ivey because, um, well, because when you look at him, it's like getting an injection of pure rock fury adrenaline right into the middle of your circulatory system. Um, but anyway, uh Maybe we could call this Roxegesis, because it's a lyrical, cultural video discussion of a popular music phenomenon thing, or I don't know, I don't know how much you could call it, lick it up popular music these days. That's an entirely different point, but anyway, um, yeah, Roxegesis, that would be the word I would point for it. Um, it's not really an original concept. I did have a class in high school that was called Literature and Music, and it's that was exactly what it says in the tin. It was, you know, we uh, did a lot of talking about rock and roll lyrics. Um, mostly at that time, it wasn't things like Lick It Up. It was things like all the prog rock, Led Zeppelin, Pink Floyd, Rushy kind of uh, Ayn Rand and the Father of the Four Winds and the Great Deceiver and the uh, concept album, the Snacks Laps of all that kind of stuff. That was like trying to be literature. Lick It Up was never really trying to be literature. But what it is a song about, it's a... Uh, it's sort of a saga about, um, it's about impatience, it's about misrepresentation. Um, above all, it's probably about housekeeping. Uh, you got to take the song in the cultural context that uh, came around. Okay, this was, this was the first album and the first video in which Kiss was showing up without any of their makeup on. They were coming naked, barefaced into the 80s. Um, the makeup came off right before that album came out, you know, and it was a big thing. It was a big unveiling. Uh, they had joked around about it before with their makeup. It was Kiss Unmasked a few years before, uh, which really didn't make sense because it, it wasn't masks. It was makeup. Like, so it was, it was sort of like they were, they were throwing you some kind of bait and switch from the start. But what it turned out was that the, uh, the mask, when the mask came off, whatever, it was, there was more makeup under the makeup as if that was their real things. That was kind of the joke involved. So no one had ever really seen them except for, uh, you know, I mean, uh, Chaim's mother had seen Chaim when he was a kid. But otherwise, no one knew what they looked like or anything. Um, so this was a... This was a really special time for them, and it, I think that the lyrics of this song in the video, they, there was a lot of symbolic symbolics. Listen to this. I'm only doing one take, so like uh, you can have thumpers in there. Um, it was their first foray into science fiction, let's say, because the video took place in some kind of uh, post-apocalyptic scenario where all the hairstyles from the 80s stayed within the desolation. Um, and you start out, and the members of KISS are approaching some kind of base camp where there's these women doing chores. Like, there's a woman uh, washing uh, something, uh, washing her laundry on a, a manhole cover, using it like a washboard, and they're otherwise doing other sort of household activities, and they're, they're eating these food from squirty condiment dispensers, like the, you know, the kind of things with ketchup and mustard in them. It's really odd. I don't even really understand why they're outdoors in the first place, because there, there are buildings around. It's not that much desolation. It just sort of seems like they're on the street and there's uh, really nobody around. Um, they're like sort of cave women, domestic servants, supermodel with 80s hairstyle crossovers living out there. It's, um, it's a peculiar setup. But uh, I would think, looking at that, they were all Lomias or something. But they're not. They're waiting for the men, and they're very excited when Kiss enters. Um, and Kiss does enter, and Paul Stanley is doing a thing like this, where he's doing something with his, his shoulders and snapping his fingers. And it's very... It's, it's, it's predictable that Paul Stanley would dance and do things like that because they had already showed a couple years earlier that uh, Kiss was kind of comfortable with La Disco as you saw from when they were singing I Was Made For Loving You, um, which was daring at the time. 
because, uh, you know, considering doing disco and rock together in the 70s, that was rough like being a bisexual in the 50s. Only like Kiss and Rod Stewart and bands like that could pull it off. And uh, and then they had to later on, like, put a lampshade on it and say that, oh, you know, that disco song was we were just experimenting. It's not really what we were like. There's really a lot of parallels between bisexuality and uh, doing disco and rock together in the 70s. Um, but that's another topic entirely also. On to the words of the song. I think that these women in the video are, uh, they're domestic servants. They're cave women domestic servants. I think it's symbolic of a uh, domestic servant that Paul Stanley was writing his lyrics for. Because from the context of the song, I'm gathering that Paul Stanley was writing this song to his uh, clean-up woman, band assistant, uh, trailer person who helped out with stuff as a way of getting her to clean up all the makeup that they had just removed and left in the trailer. And the first verse of the song is where he is given that a very positive spin. And he's talking about, don't want to wait till you know me better. Let's just be glad for the time together. Life's such a treat, this. And it's time you taste it. There ain't a reason on earth to waste it. It ain't a crime to be good to yourself. So he's talking almost like, uh, this is almost like Susan Powder territory. Although Susan Powder was really overweight at this point. But never mind. Um, of supportive kind of uh, build yourself up, self-help fodder. Uh, while well, he's really just trying to get her to do her job. And then he gets right to the chorus where he goes, lick it up, lick it up, and it gets confusing. Lick it up, lick it up, it's only right now. Um, I really had some of my best people work on this and were unclear on whether he meant it's only right now as in it's only the right thing to do. It's, you know, lick it up, it's only the right thing to do. You're the cleanup person, and we hired you. We're paying you good money to clean up. So it's only right that you clean it up. Uh, which would be getting kind of forceful. Or he could be saying right now. Like, it's only right now. We're only taking off this makeup once. It's gone, honey, okay? It's gone. Like, just do it once. Just clean it up, and you're never getting this job again. There's never going to be a big kiss makeup cleanup thing anymore because it's all over. I don't know. Either way, it works out the same, though. Whether it's like, look it up because the right thing to do or only do it right now. It's all about Paul Stanley's trying to get his cleanup woman to clean up all of the makeup. You don't need to wait for an invitation. You gotta live like you're on vacation. There's something sweet you can't buy with money. Lick it up. I don't know. It, it's, it's ironic. I think Paul Stanley might have been trying to sell something to these people that no one would be interested in buying. Because is this really a vacation? Is it really what it means to be good to yourself? Because if you like Paul Stanley, being good to yourself means licking shit up off the street, evidently. Uh, that doesn't work for me, for a lot of people. You know, it's... No matter how you slice it, you know, the... It's not that cool. But I'll tell you what. You can draw your own conclusion. 